few introductory remarks. I'm Graham Shamil, Executive Director of the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences. Uh, we're a non-profit organization researching the fundamental aspects of marine microbiology in the oceans and its relationship to both climate change, human impacts, and also discovery. Uh, it's a great privilege to be representing the institution and to be able to host this 10-week uh, series of Café Scientifique lectures uh, throughout the summer months. Um, as I said, before introducing the speaker, though, I thought I might just sort of set the scene uh, for some of the things that uh, Richard's going to be talking about this evening. Now, imagine a world 55 million years ago when half of the deep-sea organisms died. It was the paleo eocene thermal maximum. It was a point when carbon dioxide was very high in the atmosphere along with methane and it was having catastrophic consequences on life in the ocean. We now know that carbon, carbon dioxide is rising in the oceans faster than at that time in the geologic past. We know that 16% of coral reefs have now died from coral bleaching events. Ocean life is changing rapidly as we know it, and as scientists, part of our mission is to understand the interrelationship of those organisms and the ecology they support. Just a few weeks ago, uh, a, a non-governmental organization called the Intergovernmental Panel for uh, the State of the Oceans released a report that pointed to really quite dire warnings on the state of the oceans. And they identified three major issues that we need to deal with. Uh, the first is climate change, the sorts of things I've just been mentioning. Secondly is fisheries on the high seas, essentially unregulated fishing on the open ocean. And the third is the establishment of marine protected areas, areas of the ocean where we will seek to manage the living resources and understand the biogeochemistry of the ocean waters in such a way that we will endeavor to ensure that they exist for future uh, mankind. And it's sort of in that context that we're delighted to welcome uh, Richard Rockefeller tonight. Richard has stepped in at very short notice uh, for our intended guest speaker, David Shaw, uh, who is uh, part, uh, chairing the Sargasso Sea Alliance. We're going to hear about that uh, topic in this presentation. Uh, Richard is a, a physician and a philanthropist. Uh, he has practiced and taught medicine in Portland, here in Maine, from 1982 to the uh, year 2000. And for a, a Good part of that time, 1989 to 2010, he's been chairing the U.S. Advisory Board of Doctors Without Borders. That's the uh, same as, I think it's the same as Médecins Sans Frontières, yes. Uh, and has undertaken that in many uh, developing countries around the world. Uh, he has been a tremendous advocate for non-profit organization and uh, human health and medicine helping and serving as president of the Health Commons Institute. He's a current member of the board of the Maine Coast Heritage Trust and was the chair from 2000 to 2006. And currently is a member of the steering committee of the Sargasso Sea Alliance, which is the topic that Richard's going to talk to us about tonight. And it's a really great privilege to welcome him here to, to Booth Bay and to Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences, particularly at such a short notice. So thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. Good. All right. It's a it's a great system here for a rather old hall. You have all the equipment one needs to give such a talk, and that's a good thing because I'm not sure I have the equipment needed to give <laughs> this talk. <clears throat> There's an advantage to doing this, by the way. We probably all have performance dreams, and I don't think I'll ever have to have one again after this because <laughs> all. I do have my clothes on, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you, when I could see you before the lights were in my eyes, you looked friendly. So those are those are two two parts that uh, that aren't always the case in my dreams. But on the other hand, I have I am a consummate non-expert in this area. I didn't know I was going to be giving this talk, and never have given it before. 
uh, until yesterday, and uh, I have had to try to combine two people's slides into one slideshow, so you'll see some glitches. There, there may be moments, for those of you who have seen The Matrix, where it feels as though we, there's a glitch in The Matrix and things don't quite fit together. So <laughs> forgive me for all of that. I'll do the very best I can. Uh, I do have on my side the, the fact that I am really passionate about the oceans. From Graham's introduction, you see that I have not done uh, oceans conservation work in the past. I really only began it a year and a half ago when I took a trip sponsored by a, a TED-related organization called Mission Blue, Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue, to the Galapagos Islands, where I met some of the world's great ocean protection advocates and philanthropists and scientists, got really turned on to any number of areas of uh, potential work and protection in the ocean, but I took this one on for reasons which I hope will become clear. It really was because, uh, first of all, it felt like low-hanging fruit. The Sargasso Sea, which I'm going to talk about, is unprotected, but it doesn't have lots of opponents of protection. And it, the, the presentation suggested that for only a few million dollars, three to five million dollars, we could potentially create the world's largest marine protected area and one of the first high seas marine protected areas. And so far, that, uh, that in, uh, offer uh, is bearing, bearing hope. We, we will be, have spent about a million dollars this year. We think we can complete this task within four to five years. So it's, it's great fun to be involved with. It's something I have wanted to be involved with, that is to say, oceans protection <clears throat> for a very long time and sort of only recently got around to it. One of these buttons switches to my email instead of, <laughs> <laughs> instead of pointing the laser pointer, it switches over to my email, so I'm going to try to be very careful. <laughs> In fact, I'm, I'm, I'll know by the end whether this is actually a dream or a... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I'd like to talk about what and where the Sargasso Sea is, a little bit about the Sargasso Sea Alliance, who we are, and, uh, but n not too much on that really for the time being. Uh, and then what the threats are, Graham gave a good overview. I'll unpack that just a little bit for you. Um, what the values of, of why, why protect the Sargasso Sea instead of some other place in the high seas in the ocean, and uh, then a little bit about what we're hoping to do about all of this. As I say, there will be, there will be gaps. Let's try this. Yay, the first <laughs> slide switch worked. So uh, the Sargasso Sea Alliance, I'll be coming back to this, but very briefly, it's something that didn't exist a year ago. I think we formally incorporated the, the end of last calendar year. Uh, it's led, and this is important, by the government of Bermuda, although the, the by definition, a high seas doesn't, a high seas area is away from the exclusive economic zone of any uh, land, Bermuda is smack, if, if, uh, you'll see in a minute, actually I can go forward and, whoops, there, you see it's roughly ellipse shaped, and Bermuda is at one of the foci of the ellipse, for those of you who are mathematicians here, and they are greatly interested in the waters around them, and if, to get law of the high seas changed internationally, it's, it's essential for one country with a, a deep interest to take the lead and the government of Bermuda, small as it is, it's a country of, uh, it's a, not even a full country if it's a protectorate or whatever of Great Britain, but it has only 60,000 people, but they have international standing. They came forward to, um, uh, to lead this coalition. And I won't go through all of the groups involved. The main thing is that they're really heavy hitters, people who have signed on as part of the alliance and again, this has taken place in a short time, and we will need all the heavy uh, iron that these groups can provide to get this done, because again, if we, if this is going to involve changes in laws of the high seas, which are, you have to round up an awful lot of people to be able to do that. 
the global oceans are in peril. Um, and I won't reiterate all that Graham said. I will say that, first of all, the oceans contain, uh, this is not exactly accurate. The oceans actually are 70% of the planet. It's the high seas beyond national jurisdiction that's 50%. And in the oceans, they're by far the largest uh, font of biodiversity anywhere in the world. The oceans are, well, nobody knows yet how much oxygen uh, is released by the oceans and how much carbon is captured by them, but it's immense, certainly rival, rivaling closely that of the land. The fisheries are dangerously overexploited. I don't know how well all of you will be able to see all this from the back. Um, and there's enormous habitat uh, destruction from both pollution and develop, uh, development. Some of what's going on in the ocean is preventable at the level of the ocean, some of it is not. The carbon dioxide that is uh, acidifying the ocean at a rate that's utterly horrifying, as, as Graham said, 15% we've, we've, of the coral is already gone, and it's likely even if we don't dump any more carbon into the ocean, the atmosphere and then it equilibrates with the ocean. Even if we dump no more carbon in, the chances are that within 50 to 100 years, acidification will have proceeded to the point where uh, it's not possible for a great many of the microorganisms that are at the bottom, that calcify their shells at the bottom of the food chain for the fish, that many of them will go extinct or at least be unavailable to the fish, and uh, much of the coral around the world will be gone even if we don't do more. I'm saying that because it's just such a horrifying fact that it's for people who say, well, global warming itself from carbon may be a good thing, uh, they're wrong, and putting this much carbon into the oceans is just going to be devastating for, for uh, life in the oceans and life on Earth. This is the where. Again, it's a, uh, the, this, the Sargasso Sea is the only ocean in the world, and it's identified as an ocean, it's the only ocean in the world that is not bounded by land. It's bounded by uh, the, the North Atlantic Gyre. It's actually several, the Gulf Stream one uh, to the west, but there's several other currents named differently that circulate around this uh, elliptical body and have been doing so for 135 million years as far as we can tell. Um, there's, uh, there are implications of that that I'll get back to a little bit later. Uh, it's called the Sargasso Sea because it has sargassum weed in it. This is a, a photograph of the weed. So it's a, an algae, actually, and there are two different main types whose name, if I had given this talk before, I would remember. Sylvia <laughs> <laughs> uh, Earl, who's kind of Jack the modern day Jacques Cousteau, the, real, the, the world's great spokesperson for the oceans, called this the giant golden floating rainforest of the sea. And for good reason it is, it's, it's golden colored. Uh, it's not always as thick as this, but it is, the, I actually tried to find out on the internet and calling people today how much biomass is involved. Uh, we don't know, it is immense, and it covers an area of two million square miles. And it's, uh, as I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you, it's habitat, and it provide, it's, a, it's an essential resource, both as a carbon sink, but also for habitat for oxygen, oxygen production and others. Oh, look, somebody kindly put there under the notes, two species of sargassum algae, okay. fluitons and mitons. For those of you who are taking notes, how it's spread with this. Oh, yeah, and one other, a, a, an interesting point. It reproduces without ever touching land. It does wash up on the shores of the contiguous uh, land masses, um, but it, all of its life is it, at sea in this uh, floating mass. The Bermuda Triangle, the famous uh, uh, Bermuda Triangle, is within the Sargasso Sea, and uh, I, I, that there is no verity to the, the, the tales of people being lost mysteriously in the Bermuda Triangle, but it is a strange thing to come across and was for sailors who first ventured into this because it's often, part of it is in the horse latitudes where there's very little wind, so it just sits there and boats can feel as though they're sort of enmeshed in it for days at a time in the sailing days.
So I'm going to go into this just a little bit more, but uh, sargassum is important in the life history of many species. You can read them there. Uh, and at the moment, there is very little international protection for it. This cutaway picture is um, interesting in a, in a number of respects. It reminds me to, to reiterate that this has been going on for 135 million years. It has been 10% of it is re, uh, replaced every year, and the rest dies and sinks down to the bottom. And there is an enormous amount of Earth's history uh, down on the bottom here, and almost no exploration has taken place whatsoever. We don't actually know what we're going to learn from the, the existence of the sediments underneath there, and yet there's no law regulating it and trawling and seabed mining and cable laying have taken place without any kind of regulation. So that's one, it's not even a major reason for protecting it, but the ability to know what's down there before we begin doing things to it is, seems uh, like a good thing. The, um, yeah, so it's not, it's existing, I'll get back to the threats in just a minute. Uh, this is another picture of uh, the world seas. The light blue that you can see in here are the ex uh, your economic ex exclusive economic zones of different countries. And the dark blue is the 50% of the Earth's surface that is beyond national jurisdiction, just so you can see. A number of interesting points here, not all relevant to this talk, but uh, the great mass of it is in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the economic exclusion zone of Bermuda is right here. The laws applicable to economic EEZs are entirely different from laws of the high seas. With the Pew Foundation, I won't talk too much about the effort to protect the almost 150,000 square miles within Bermuda's EEZ, but it's another effort that's being supported by the Pew Foundation right now. It's extremely important because if we get a 2,000, we probably won't create a, a, a no-take marine protected area all the, we know we won't get it all the way to Bermuda shores because the Bermudians do fish. But they don't usually fish out past 250 miles. So you can imagine a donut that goes from 50 miles out to 200 miles out. And if the Bermuda government will go along with it, and they're working closely with Pew, we could get about 120,000 square miles of no take zone, no fishing around Bermuda itself. It would be the first one in the world, and that donut concept was proposed by a young woman who's the head of the fisheries department in Bermuda, just sort of brainstorming with us in one of our meetings uh, last fall, and it's taken off like wildfire. The IUCN and Na Nature Conservancy are taking this idea of creating donut-shaped marine protected areas that can be instantly uh, created by island states around the entire world because there's almost very few of them fish beyond their 50 mile zone and nobody until this young Bermudian had thought of the idea of doing this. So if we're able as part of this alliance effort to move that forward, we could suddenly have a great deal more protection around the world than we've done. So we're excited by the prospect, but the alliance is, is not directly involved in that uh, at the moment. Why the Sargasso Sea is so special, um, there, the bluefin tuna and a number of other pelagic fish breed in the Sargasso Sea, and as far as we know, uh, the, the bluefin tuna that breeds there, we don't know how much of the world's stock of bluefin tuna breeds there, we don't know how much they depend on it, but we know that it's substantial, and there is, I'm gonna, I may come back to this, not, I'll come back to the question of the bluefin tuna in a minute, uh, there are threatened and endangered species that are strongly dependent on this. The turtles, humpback whales, American and European eels, and I will go on to that. Uh, these are the turtles from all over the sea. All turtles all around the world, all marine uh, turtles, are 
uh, threatened, and a great number of them on the European and American shores scuttle out as fast as they can, as you've all seen the movies of the turtles being born on the beaches and being eaten by birds and so forth. Uh, what It turns out that what for years they called, um, they, uh, there was something called the lost year of the turtles, because the turtles left the beaches when they were little tiny critters, and then came back, uh, showed up again when they were a year old as mature turtles, relatively mature, and nobody knew where they went in between. And it turns out now that they go to the sargassum weed and hide in it. They're kind of disguised inside it. They feed off the weed itself. And uh, while they're growing large enough not to be taken by bird predators, this is where they, this is where they stay. And they're well out of, out of uh, the range of the birds as well as uh, being protected from other predators during this time. It's an essential habitat for juvenile fishes of all sorts. I was in Bermuda uh, last fall, last August actually, a year ago, and we were taken out, and they had one of the marine organizations on Bermuda had done a sweep through a section of sargasso weed and caught almost all of these juvenile fishes. It's very cool because they look exactly like what they look like as adults, except that they're about an inch long. Including, there was a swordfish with a sword on the end of the thing, but it was an inch long. It's just well worth going there and going to see just for that reason. Again, it's habitat for game fish, and game fishermen love it because uh, the, uh, apparently fish love to live under any floating surface, but they particularly like to live under here because so many of the juveniles of all kinds of species live in the weed and if they venture forth these these guys can get them so fishermen uh, it's a it's an important area for fishermen with the caveat that it's darn hard to get to because it's more than by definition uh, uh, more than 200 miles offshore so it's really not that many sport fishermen do uh, within bermuda's economic exclusion zone uh, that's one of the important sources of income for bermuda um, Barbara Block is a scientist who tracks, among other things, she's a marine scientist, but she tracks bluefin tuna and tracks other large pelagic species around the world. These are a couple of the plots that she's done. The upper graph shows the tracks in the more recent kind of, here's where they uh, have, have identified the, uh, the young breeding bluefin tuna, and here are the tracks that they take across the Atlantic, and you can see that it's just right smack through the uh, Sargasso Sea. Just a picture of a bluefin tuna to remind me, this is an extraordinary iconic species, massively threatened. They, they used to grow up to 15 feet. Uh, one of this size would bring $300,000 on the and so there's an obvious intense pressure on them. It's clearly we're not going to be able to shut down that fishery around the world until all nations agree that these fish need to be protected. But they are helpful in getting uh, interest in protecting, in protecting this. The Sargasso Sea is the heart historical home range of eels that spawn in North America and in Europe. It's, uh, you can see the light color over here is the range of the American eels and the green color in the European eels. Curiously, they're very closely related, but they almost never interbreed. Uh, David Freestone, who is the CEO of the uh, Sargasso Sea Alliance, says that it's uh, iconic not only of the fish in the ocean, but of the Americans and the Europeans that they, that they get together often and breed infrequently. <laughs> so, uh, but the, but uh, the eels only breed here. People around the world who depend on them for food have tried to get them to breed in isolation, have tried to do aquaculture, and it's not, they will not do it at all. They only breed here. And the, by the way, they're catadromous rather than anadromous. So anadromous fish uh, go to spawn in freshwater streams and lakes and, and then go out to sea for the rest of their adult life. Catadromous fish do the reverse. 
So they, the, uh, and, and species do the reverse. So they live most of their life in freshwater, but they go out to sea to breed. And they breed and grow to little eels, and then they swim back to where they originally were, and nobody has any idea how they get there. It's the same as the salmon they get back. The babies swim back to exactly the rivers where they used to be. Uh, more than 90% of all of the eels in the world have already uh, been taken as food or their habitats been destroyed on the land, but this is an utterly crucial habitat for the eels. This is just an overview of some of the threats. I've been alluding to them already. Uh, garbage and plastics from ships, boats, and land is a huge threat all around the world. Most of it is from the land, only a little bit from ships these days, because ships, in terms of plastic dumping anyway, have cleaned up their act a great deal. You've probably heard about the Pacific Gyre, about the size of two Texases that is filled with both large chunks of new plastic and old tiny sand-sized chunks of floating plastic, extremely toxic to the marine life. Uh, this is not as large or extensive as, uh, or as dense, I should say, as the Pacific Gyre, but it's getting that way, and um, it's just a, a it's a, it's a huge problem. Oil discharge from vessels used to be an enormous problem with tar balls all over the beaches. In the last 30 years, most of that has been cleaned up. The negative impacts of fishing, there's, I'll show you a slide in a minute up there. It's not just the fishing of the large pelagic species, it's the bycatch problem that you have in shore as well. Extraction of sargassum appeared to be a potential problem. It actually is not a bad source, a base for biofuel. People were beginning to extract it. The, one of the international bodies uh, made a law that you, the total take can be no more than 5,000 tons, which was quite clever because that's not commercially viable. So actually, there's no extraction of sargassum now already. Um, one big potential problem, uh, ships are not allowed to discharge any of their ballast waters within the ec uh, exclusive economic zones, the EU and so they all do it out at sea. There are toxins in there, but there are also introduced species of, and it's of unknown consequence to the, uh, the, the Sargasso Sea. Climate change and ocean acidification I've already mentioned, and it's not something that by protecting this area we're going to be able to do anything about it. You can see that it's precisely within this gyre that the, the enclosed, the sea enclosed by currents, that the greatest density of plastics is in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, shipping is another threat. This was a one-month survey of uh, shipping across the Atlantic. Again, its greatest density is right in the Sargasso Sea. <clears throat> Just images of the collateral impacts of shipping, both inshore and offshore. This was a slide I swiped from one of the other talks that I was going to try to get. Now I can't read what that says, but it has to do with harvesting of a Sargasso. I've already mentioned that. There are some existing protective measures, and I won't go into them, in part because I don't know the law of the high seas very well, but, it, uh, but the main point is that we're going to, we're not, in the Sargasso Sea Alliance, our intention is not to create new law where we don't have to, we're going to piggyback upon laws that already exist, and some of this has to do with uh, fish habitats um, and extraction of tuna, back for a moment to the Sargasso Sea Alliance, and by the way, that's a picture of a glassy eel over there, a larva of a glass eel, which is not the most common eel, but it's one of the many that uh, migrate to the shores of the, uh, of the US and Europe. Our aims, in part, are uh, public awareness of the value of the existence and the value of the Sargasso Sea the use of existing sectoral organizations, that is to say the shipping organizations, fishing organizations, seabed mining, and uh, conservation organizations to, uh, to, to join with them and encourage them to adopt new regulation, self-regulation in accordance with the Law of the Sea Convention of 1982, to which the U.S. is not still a signatory, a sign, a signatory but uh, we, we adhere to its principles by and large. And then 
to me, most importantly, if we can do this, if we can protect an area of one to two million square miles in the high seas here, where it's relatively easy to do, we will have brought about changes in the laws of the high seas and understanding by the countries that border on the seas and have an interest in that law uh, that can be used as precedents for protection all around the world. And people who have surveyed the high seas say that this is by far the easiest place. If you're going to do it anywhere, start here and then, and then go from there. One, an ultimate goal will be to create a marine, international marine protected area. This is a map of all the existing marine protected areas around the world. Uh, it actually is substantially larger than I thought it would be, and I'm delighted to see that. But as you can see, there are the Chagos over here. This is the newest uh, marine protected area. It's the only one, to my knowledge, that incorporates areas beyond national jurisdiction so far. And so if we are able to do ours, uh, we will have in immensely, you can you can see where the Sargasso would see would be off to the right. We will have immensely increased the amount of protection in the world's oceans. There, the reason I have this down here, the Nature Conservancy, who is working with the Economic AEZ of Bermuda, looks upon a marine protected area as a no-take zone. That's their definition. And we would, it would be nice around more parts of the world to have no take whatsoever in order to protect the fish. Uh, you probably know 90% of all the fish in the world is already gone and it's going fast. So we desperately need areas where nobody fishes at all. It's not practical, it wouldn't work to make this 2 million square miles into a, a no take area, but the, uh, uh, the UN's definition of a marine protected area is more loose. It's a defined area which is designated for regulated or regulated and managed to achieve specific conservation of objectives. And we are outlining those objectives right now. Our strategy is pragmatic, and the print, it's not on this slide, but the principal way in which it's pragmatic is we're working to uh, create protections one by one, rather than create the whole thing into one grand uh, MPA with a bow tie around it. We're taking what's already existing, trying to strengthen it, and we're acting before the law of the, hot, the seas uh, can change because that just takes too long. So, as I mentioned before, <coughs> submitting proposals uh, through the sectoral organizations, we've, we've been in existence a very short time, but we've already made presentations to almost all of these organizations, and I'm happy to say that the reception has been very warm so far. Now, in part, that's because an awful lot of what we're asking for to begin with is entirely voluntary. And they say, well, if the other ones do it, we'll do it. And they, it's not something that they're bound by law to abide to. So shipping, fishing, excuse me. Seabed mining, seabed mining is a really interesting thing. Um, uh, Bob Ballard, who's a charismatic seabed explorer and terrific environmentalist, believes that there, I just heard him give a talk a couple of weeks ago, which is why I raised this. He believes that seabed mining is going to be an enormous, the, 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 the mid-ocean trench ridges cut are 42,000 miles long, uh, extensive through all the world's oceans, and they distill and bring up enormous amounts of rare, earth, rare earths and all kinds of minerals, and not rare ones, gold. Not only rare ones, gold and silver and titanium and everything else, they can concentrate in there. It's very deep, it's very hard to extract, but the world is wildly interested in extracting it. He believes it's relatively safe, but there's a lot, a lot of people have uh, done monitoring of where seabed mining has taken place and, and believe that there's a tremendous threat from toxins. And so, again, working early, getting the data, doing the, good, the science on seabed mining before it's a free-for-all around the world seems like a good idea. The World Heritage Convention is one of the bodies that we wish to work through, and it's, um, I don't think that it was our group, but another high seas oceans protection group sort of chided them because they, their motto is preserving and sharing the wonders of our world, preserving and sharing the wonders of our world. 
And somebody pointed out to them that they should, their motto should really be uh, preserving and sharing the wonders of half our world because they had not taken into account any of the deep oceans. And uh, they have taken that to heart and in fact hope to use our Sargasso Sea protection as a way of changing that and really make, they'd like to turn what we're doing into one of the World Heritage Foundation sites. Hoping to use wildlife convention. We'll use whatever protections we possibly can. And uh, this is my concluding slide and it just says the Sargasso Sea, um, a catalytic event in ocean protection, question mark. But when I transferred one slide to the other, lost the dark background. <laughs> uh, and that's what we hope. This is a picture of Sylvia Earle, remarkable, uh, she just turned 75 last August. We celebrated her birthday in Bermuda and she chose, and she, she advocates for the world's oceans everywhere, all the time. She sleeps about four hours a night and at age 75 she never stops. It's a remarkable uh, ability that I, that I'm envious of. And she, as I say, she chose to celebrate her 75th birthday in Bermuda around this project because she considers it one of the really great and crucial projects for oceans protection. With that, I will stop. I'm happy to answer questions as best I can. And let's see how we're doing. That's an amazing. That's 40 minutes right on the, on the dot. So I'm happy to take your questions. I'm not sure I'll be able to see you, but let's try yes in the front here. And actually, could I ask somebody, if I really can't see too well in the back, so if Graham, perhaps you could help me pick. Oh, good. So turning up the light. Good idea, turning up the lights. Now, yes, ma'am. This is a picture of a flying fish. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, yes. The same flying fish is one of the great sights of the world. In great schools, they will come skip. They fly uh, 100 feet through the air. They glide more than fly. And when you're in a small boat, uh, 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 they will <coughs> slam into your sails and land into your deck. And it's just <laughs> it's really, it's a lovely thing. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thanks for stepping in at the last minute. Um, explain what the $5 million will do in terms of producing this and moving it forward. What's the purpose of the fundraising? And, uh, and frankly, that seems fairly cheap. Exactly. So the question is, what will the $5 million do? And, uh, and with an observation that that seems fairly cheap, it's $5 million. If you could protect 2 million square miles with $5 million, you'd have, you'd have done very well. I don't have the budget in front of me, and that wasn't exactly my side of it, but I was creating the organization itself uh, is one part. Doing the science is another, and I didn't really go into the science that we have done so far, but it's really proceeding apace. There are terrific organizations based in Bermuda and several in the U.S. and, and one in Britain that are involved in this. It's about a million dollars worth of science in documenting the existing state of the Sargasso Sea and really documenting more completely the threats that we think exist. Uh, so that's part of it. I, create, I don't know how much it's actually cost to create the organization so far. We have a, a staff of three in Washington, D.C., and there's obviously a great deal of travel all around the world. David Freestone, by the way, who's our executive director, was a, an incredible find because he is considered one of the top three experts in the law of the high seas in the entire world. So he was, we swiped him at least temporarily from International Union for Conservation of nature and uh, he is doing an extraordinary job so that's that's part of it uh, dealing with seven i haven't gone into the matter of who will make the decisions about protecting this area but there are seven governments some of which are obvious and contiguous and some of which are not so that south africa for some reason has standing related to sargasso sea and i i nobody has explained to me satisfactorily why that's so the traveling to those countries, bringing them on board, going to conferences, getting the word out, that obviously will cost quite a bit. And then, although the five million will not, I mentioned that much of the early protection will be voluntary, but there will be some that will be by regulation. 
getting those regulations through in countries uh, is going to be more expensive. And then there may be, we're not sure, there are more radical ideas having areas of the Sargasso where you not only can't fish, but you can't go through them at all. They're simply like wilderness areas and off limits. Monitoring and enforcement of anything that's non-voluntary is not included in this budget. It's, it is daunting, but it's not quite as daunting as it sounds, at least the monitoring part. So the idea is this, that if you have to, ships nowadays have to have transponders, and they're not yet satellite-linked transponders, but they're going to be within the next five years, so that satellites can keep track of all ships beyond a certain size that are out in the, in the ocean anywhere. And by the patterns that those ships make as they go back and forth, you can certainly tell who's trawling, but you can tell a lot else about the ship. So monitoring is not as ridiculously impossible as it sounds. And then enforcement, where nobody's going to send their government navies out to stop people from, uh, you know, cleaning out their bilges in a way that's not um, that's not permitted. Uh, however, if the mo if the monitoring that we do, and if people voluntarily submit to uh, additional kinds of electronic monitoring, if they don't go along with this, and if all the nations have, that are, have jurisdiction agree that this is what we want to do in these particular areas, you can deny access to your ports to those ships, and that's the that's the enforcement that's most being considered at this point because seven mostly abutting nations saying, no, sorry, your ship is out of compliance, you can't come in here, that's, that's, um, that's probably sufficient um, a warning. Okay. Uh, one back here, and then and you, yes, ma'am? Uh, you gave a short script to the uh, ratification of the law of the sea by the U.S. Um, why? Because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, but that's, that's uh, um, uh, the shortest and most honest answer I can give you. I, I don't. It was Reagan who, who chose not to, and uh, it's not clear to me why, other than Re Reagan was the anti-regulation president. So that that may be the full explanation. I don't know. Yes, sir. Yes. Could you comment on Sarah Gasson? its content, its composition, its origin, its depth? As best I can. And it's not science that I know well. The depth is very, very shallow. It really, when the sea is stirred up, of course, it goes down deeper and eventually floats back to the surface. I don't know if you can see from those pictures or whether I can find them again, but uh, it, it's, it has little air-filled balls, as a lot of seaweed along our shores also does. Um, and, and a very beautiful, fine filigree that goes underneath of that. So it floats itself, and ordinarily in a calm sea, it doesn't float beyond about a foot deep, and sometimes less than that. There are, uh, its composition beyond that, it's an algae, and, but I, being a non-marine biologist, I can't tell you exactly what that means in differentiate. For example, I'm not sure, is, can people here tell me whether seaweed is an algae? I don't know. Yes? So it's related to seaweed, except it's not connected to anything except the sea itself. It, you, your question reminds me to uh, mention that there are also many unique species that live nowhere but in the Sargasso Sea. There's something called the Sargassum fish that looks very cuddly and cute, except that it's among the, it's tiny, it only grows to about uh, 10 centimeters long, but it's an absolutely rapacious fish disguised precisely like the sargassum weed. It's the same golden color and it has little bubbly things coming off of it and it looks just like sargassum, but when another, uh, a larval fish comes along, it jumps out and eats it and, and that's one that exists only there and there are a number of other fishes. Uh, was there another part to your question? The origin. The origin, meaning uh, by uh, evolutionary origin of it? I, I don't know, and I I, I uh, would guess that it is not known unless people have do, done DNA analyses, because I doubt if much of it is fossilized, or, uh, I, but I don't know, I'm sorry. So it's been there forever? Uh, it has been there, there 
I don't know what the evidence is to support this, but they do know that the gyre has been there for 135 million years, and they, David Freestone says that there's evidence that sargassum has been in that gyre for that length of time. So that's a really long time for it to, and the reason why other life has evolved to, to live in there. Yes, way back. What makes up the bulk of the plastic that's floating up in the ocean? What makes up the bulk of the plastic there, I... The bulk of the plastic in the Pacific gyre, and I presume it would be the same in the Atlantic gyre, is single-use plastics. So I thank you for raising that question because we should, there's, a, there's a, a group out of California called the Plastics Pollution Coalition, run by a very energetic woman named Deanna Cohen, who makes jewelry out of the, the plastics, but it, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but she uses that to bring public awareness to it. So single-use plastics, such as the, uh, the what you put beer cans in, what do you, whatever you call those, that, that also six-pack six things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all of the plastic bottles that we drink water out of, it just does not make sense. So please, people, if you can avoid using single plastic, the, the water we drink, particularly in Maine, that we get in our little nice cups is perfectly good water, no, no less good than the water you get in those bottles. And carrying a thermos or flask or one thing or another to carry your water out is simply much better. There is, uh, in California now, there is a bill uh, moving through to uh, eliminate the use of single-use plastic water bottles, and then they'll go from there. It's, from there, it's everything. Obviously, in Maine, as you go along the shores, a great deal of the detritus is from the fishing industry. Uh, that is true in fishing. Whether that's true of the plastic that ends up in the gyres, I don't know, but it's equally or more toxic. What ends up on our beaches gets mixed in with the wetlands and then washed back out to sea is, is highly toxic. Um, so, but again, beyond the single-use consumer items, uh, it's every kind of plastic that tends to go into dumps here, a certain fraction of it doesn't end up in the dumps. It ends up through one means or another in the ocean. Yes? Um, for the last, well, I've probably visited Bermuda every year for 45 years. For the last 21, I've taken students and we stay at the Biological Institute of Bios, yeah. Ocean Sciences. Mm -hmm. And last March, we did our major community service in um, taking 25-foot transepts on two plastic hotspots on Bermuda and um, a meter from the transept line at, hot, at the high tide mark. We collected 471 little bits of plastic that are whirling around in that gyre and coming in. But we also collected 171 bits of tar that they suspect has come from the Gulf Stream. Uh, and this, and then we saw a couple turtle necropsies that yeah. are had their stomachs absolutely filled with plastic. Think they're not hungry and die of starvation. And yeah. my students were so turned on that I heard last night on the news that Hassan, they took it back to the student government, is now gotten, they're trying to reduce all kinds of carbon everything. And they have now got a bus deal so they can stop um, commuting by cars with uh, the Bangor transportation system for one year to give it a try. But things like this, we should not yeah, well, thank you for that. I don't know how much you could all hear, but about this, maybe taking students to Bermuda every year and, 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 measuring. and measuring what they come up with. And it is extraordinary on the beaches because Bermuda is right smack in the gyre, sorry, in the gyre an enormous amount of plastic. Both the little tiny bits and the larger bits get washed up. And uh, she mentioned a necropsy that was done on the turtles in Bermuda. It's the turtles, you said, right? Uh, where they look at the stomach contents, and yes, that's one of the main, that, 
There are many things endangering the turtles around the world, but they mistake it for food routinely and they eat these little bits of plastic and it doesn't go through their systems and in many cases it just, it either starves them because there's no room for anything else or it kills them outright. So, well, good for you for doing that and, and uh, uh, one can only hope that the world's attention gets turned toward this. It seems so easy to stop using single-use plastic things. There are many alternatives that biodegrade and won't get caught up forever, as far as we can tell, in these gyres. Uh, you also mentioned, by the way, that there were tar bowls and that they suspect that they may have been carried in the Gulf Stream. There is a gyre in the Gulf of Mexico that mostly just goes round and round and round and from the enormous uh, BP spill. Uh, a, a lot of that oil was more volatile, either broken down, biodegraded by, by the uh, microorganisms, much more than anybody, much more than I expected anyway. Uh, and, or, and if some of it was more volatile and went into the atmosphere, but certainly some of that, the heavier oils, did turn into tar, boils, tar balls. And uh, there is a very small amount of the gyre in the Gulf Stream that then, here's the Gulf Stream here, it connects around, connects around this way and it goes around the tip of Florida and up into the, the North Atlantic gyre. So they are connected in a one-way fashion. Nothing, so they think that the sargassum weed, this gets back to your question, they think the sargassum weed probably originated in a, another place in the Gulf Stream and then got carried around and uh, seeded the gyre itself because, but nothing goes from the sargassum seed back into the Gulf Stream. Yes, sir? It's not relevant to your talk, but it's not because you're such a wonderful organization. <laughs> Only to agree with you that they are. And you know, my comment would be is that it's uh, when I was growing up, environmentalists were environmentalists and humanitarians were humanitarians, and almost never the twain did meet. And they didn't agree on anything because if you're an environmentalist, you see that human, I mean, anybody who's a radical environmentalist sees. Humans, as the invasive species, sees humans as the problem, which it's, we unarguably are in one respect. But humanitarians see environmentalists as getting in their way, and you know the. And when I first got involved with Doctors Without Borders in 1989, there was nobody involved with that organization. They were the most radical humanitarians you'd ever meet. So they did not care at all that Africa was choking on the black plastic that comes from the supermarkets, and they didn't. The, the environmental footprint of this organization just, it didn't register and they would look at you like you were crazy if you ever talked about the environment. Likewise, I, you know, there are environmentalists I know who, here in Maine who just, who, who were against humanitarian efforts. In the last 15 or 20 years, that has changed a great deal. And I think it's a good thing because obviously humans can't survive if we kill our environment and the other way around, humans are absolutely in charge of what happens in the world in the near term. And if you have starving people around the world, their interest is not going to be in protecting fish in an ocean they never even saw. So we, we have to, uh, we all have to be both humanitarians and environmentalists, no matter which one is our native proclivity, we need to, we need to support both.
you all very much for coming. There'll be another one of these next week. But above all, thank you, Richard. Yes.